This is A New Angle, a show about cool people doing awesome things in and around Montana. I'm your host, Justin Angle. This show is supported by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and the University of Montana College of Business. Hey folks, welcome back and thanks for tuning in. Today, I'm speaking with Tim Gordon. Master appraiser of art and antiques. It's usually just off to the races. Um, It's like if an exciting project comes up, we just buy the airplane tickets and go. Tim has been a leading authority in the appraisal business for over 25 years, working on projects like Princess Diana's gown collection, the Jim Morrison estate, the Al Capone family collection, and the collections of Yellowstone National Park. He's got some cool stories to share, and we're excited to hear them. Tim, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, you're welcome. Great to be here. Yeah, so tell us, where did you grow up and what did your parents do? Well, you know, I grew up in Missoula, Montana. Yeah, was, right uh, here. You know, one of those guys too stupid to leave, I think. Uh, <laughs> but no, it's it's the best place on the in the world. You know, you can imagine how deep my roots are here. And so my family, they had Gordon Construction here. My father is Matt Gordon, and that company was started in the 1940s with their father. Yeah, that's that's my background. And, you know, I've, I've traveled around the world. I've toured around the world. And my business is about half here and about half around the planet. Okay. Give us the brief version of how you got into this line of work. It started when I was a kid. As I grew up, my mother, uh, she had grown up in a tar paper shack in the oil fields. And then her father struck oil, husky oil. And so all of a sudden she's back east in a finishing school. And so this girl who grew up in oil, Montana, all of a sudden is is learning classical piano and sure. and etiquette and everything. So so anyway, fast forward to my life. You know, she has six children and and uh, she didn't have that wealth anymore. But we had her painting mm-hmm. and we had her playing the piano. And I think that that kind of instilled a lot of art and a lot of curiosity and interest in the arts in me. And so then all of a sudden I I started encountering through arts treasure and stuff and cool things yeah. from the past. I, I began my career, this sounds really goofy, but I, I began my career at age 11 as a business venture. I went to Butte, Montana and they were bulldozing the old Butte dump for a golf course. And, uh-huh. and my older brother and I filled up a truck of antique bottles. It was during the bottle craze drove them to Seattle and I made 800 bucks. Oh my man, gosh. Man, I was hooked. Yeah. I mean, that's a <laughs> so, nice payout. Yeah. And, and so all of a sudden I, I became this little freak who's a dealer all over the state at shows and I, you know, go to antique sales and, yeah. and that led more into, as I went through my teens collecting. Mm-hmm. And then in my twenties, I became a uh, kind of a full fledged dealer where I would, uh, I would find more rare things and I put out a catalog. I would type it out on a typewriter and mail it around to about 200 collectors who collected a certain genre of, of treasure. Sure. And and that became, you know, kind of the start of, of being an expert and then later an appraiser and later on TV shows like Antiques Roadshow, yeah. et cetera. So, and so did you have formal training in the arts? Did you get to study at university or like how, what was your kind of formal education? I always laugh about this. I was thrown out of Catholic school. Okay. And yeah, then I went yeah. to University of Montana to take summer courses, grabbed a GED and would do that. But there, there is no formal training for this. You know, I, I have appraised millions of things and I've, you have to see millions of things and deal with millions of things to really have the knowledge. It's kind of the main question these days that I get, one of the main ones, because people do watch that program I mentioned, is what's your specialty? And mm. I say I have a PhD on everything made in the world. My company will appraise full museums. And so it'll be super eclectic. It'll be moon rocks through dinosaurs, through Native American collections, through decorative arts. Yeah. And so uh, consequently, yeah, there's there's no education for it. There really isn't. Other than just doing it over and over again and then being seen as as an expert and being trusted as an expert. Well, there's that. I mean, certainly I study. I, I, yeah. I've read thousands of books. I have a giant library about it all. But, you know, I, I'm an expert on art. And so I've appraised major art museums front to back, all genres, all eras. But, you know, with caveats, that sometimes you need to call in a consultant on a, on a tricky one. Sure. Yeah. So so I'm smart enough to get help when I when I feel like I need help. But 
Gosh, I sound like a super egomaniac here, but I just think I can, you know, I've, I've appraised so many kinds of things. Yeah, and, I mean, maybe uh, let's talk some specifics. I mean, you, you've been on so many big projects that are well uh, known. That whether you said you just sort of finished up the, the Al Capone estate, you worked on the Jim Morrison collection. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, talk about some of the highlights from your illustrious career. Sometimes I, I just have to kind of pinch myself, you know, like uh, we'll go back to 2010 and I'm on an airplane to London and I, I go to work in the morning. I get up at my hotel and I take a black cab across town and I go to Kensington Palace and they put a, a worker's lanyard on me and I escorted it up into a room and I appraised Princess Diana's gowns. So like like that, you know, that's that's one thing that I'll always kind of hold to my heart. Sure. Was and how, getting, does that, how does that opportunity come to pass? Like when do you, when do you yeah. get to the point in your career where you're sort of like, oh yeah, we need to bring in Tim Gordon to do this? Yeah, you know, it's it's pretty cool because I don't really advertise. You know, yeah. I have a website, and so people come at me through my website. But it's it's uh, reputation and word of mouth. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you, you brought up the Al Capone estate. And so the family reached out to me through my reputation. And their grandfather was Al Capone. It was two granddaughters. And when he died in 1947, everything that he had died with just kind of got assimilated into their houses. And so that was from reputation. Or... Another interesting one is uh, when Jim Morrison died in a bathtub in Paris in mm-hmm. 1972, he had quit the working with the band, The Doors, and yep. also he was in trouble down in Miami-Dade County, and there was a stage incident, and he was being prosecuted right. for, for indecent exposure right. or whatever. But he just kind of got the hell out of Dodge. He went to Paris, and so he, he walked around Paris, and he was friends with uh, Michael McClure, who is a well-known poet of the 60s, mm-hmm. and he'd been a mentor. And so Jim just started writing poems and, and started writing songs. And so the rights to Jim's work had gone with the Corson family, who was Jim's common-law wife. And yeah. Pamela Corson had actually died of a heroin overdose. But before she did, she was talking to Michael McClure about editing all this material. And Michael McClure said, you know, you're, you're living with people who aren't good. You know, there's, there's people hanging around who are going to steal this. He goes, put this in a vault somewhere. And then recently he said, and sadly, that's what she did. Mm-hmm. And so I get a call f- from the family four or five years ago, and they want me to break open that vault. And... And so what's cool is uh, in January of this year, finally Jim Morrison's written legacy from Paris was published by Harcourt and Brace. So talk about that experience of like, when they say break open the vault, you're not in there with a crowbar (laughs) cracking the safe, but you're the first person to lay eyes and hands on this stuff and and, and introduce it to the world in a way. Yeah, here's how that process looks is I, I flew with my crew down to Santa Barbara and it was in a bank vault. And so we met with the people who represent Jim Morrison and his family and some of the Corson family. And so, um, you know, what that looks like is they finally brought it out to have me evaluate it. So I spent several days photographing everything, took those photos and my notes back to Montana and then spent, you know, months just kind of compiling the appraisal of that. But to appraise it, you have to read it and assimilate it into your head. And so... So I was the only guy for a couple of years who was really going around with all that magic in my head. I had read all those songs and poems. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So you got a jump start on history in many ways. So Tim, one thing that listeners might be curious about is, is where do you make money in this process? A lot of the dollar values you're talking about are very high, but like, where's, what's your role? As an appraiser, you know, I work hourly, like your local plumber. Sure. Um, yep. And you know, what's neat is that keeps it fair. It's like, is, there's no do, undue influence on- You have on, no perverse incentives. In yep. Case. You got it. And then uh, when, when people come to me and they have something really great to sell and, and I get them off to an auction house, then that's, that's small commissions, you know, so right. Working on a commission. Basis. Sure, and then you're representing somebody else's interests, and you can advocate for them. That makes a lot of sense. Everybody's on the same team. Yeah, it's like it's like go auction. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody wins. Yeah, right. So talk about maybe the process of putting a number on mm-hmm. on a piece of art. I mean, that there has to be like a philosophical value judgment that you're making, uh, just in terms of valuing art in general, and then specifically. How do you approach applying that philosophy to a piece? 
you look at a work of art and so there are several parameters that dictate whether or not it's it's a great piece of art by the artist at the very beginning there are databases that record just about every sale of art by any artist yep of note and so so there's always that to fall back on it at this auction that piece sold for x but but um you know there's it takes you years to this sounds kind of strange and uh, you know, i don't i don't mean to say it in the wrong way it takes you years to tell a crappy piece of art from a good piece of art sure yeah and then once you get that gut instinct you can w- walk in and immediately go out of the artist spectrum of work that's a nine out of a ten or or you know that or maybe that's too early for his career mm. or it's atypical as a painting you know this guy like joseph henry sharp in billings you know he he was a plein air artist who hung out with Maynard Dixon and George O'Keefe and those guys. And so sharp paintings have gone up around seven figures. But for every uh, nice teepee scene on, on the Yellowstone River, he also painted a pot of flowers. And so some are, are much more desirable than others. When you start getting into some of these more obscure pieces, like I shouldn't say obscure, but like Princess Diana's gown. Mm-hmm. That's more of a collectible in a way, mm-hmm. less of a less of a liquid asset than a painting. I I would assume, or like some obscure, like the empty whiskey whiskey bottle in Al Capone's vault or whatever. Like, how do you kind of start to approach valuing these items that that maybe don't have the intrinsic value that other works of art have, but have sort of story value attached to them? Sure. Um, there, there are collectors who think that those are art. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, okay. And so, so Princess Diana's gowns were were made by the world's best dressed designers of the finest materials for the greatest princess of the last two hundred years. Let's go to the empty whiskey bottle. Sure. So I actually didn't finish that story when when I went to the granddaughter's house. It flowed forth with with plenty. We found Al Capone's historic photographs from his youth. We we found you know, like a an Italian Madonna, a Carrera m- a marble Madonna that he used to say the rosary to with his granddaughters. You know, we we found his pistol, which was he called it sweetheart, is a forty five automatic pistol mm-hmm. that that set uh, kind of some records for the sale price. So let's say that you collect fine firearms, they call it steel canvas. (laughs) And, and so, you know, what I liked about his gun is it wasn't beautiful and, and, you know, it it conjured up all the history of what may or may not have happened with that. He never was, was really arrested for a a violent crime. He went to prison for tax evasion, Mm -hmm. but yet some guns are works of art, the way they're engraved or, or, you know, how they're put together. But what I liked about his was the patina of the staghorn grips. You could just see where his hand oil had seeped into it when he owned it, you know. So so there's a beauty to that that collectors see. And and going back to when I was a kid and I pulled a bottle out of a dump in Butte, there's a huge, beautiful aspect to an antique bottle that's hand-blown by an artist. It, everything made in the world is designed by an artist, industrial designers, they're great artists. The technicians that create the materials, you know, bottles or, or whether it be engraving or it's like, it's like a fine painting. We'll be back to my conversation with Tim Gordon after this short break. A New Angle is supported by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and UM's College of Business. Access to capital, broadband, and education are three ingredients any community needs for success. This is University of Montana President Seth Bodner, and you're listening to A New Angle. Welcome back to A New Angle. I'm speaking with Tim Gordon about his many adventures in appraising art and antiques. And so when you're approaching this work, I mean, you have an understanding of the market. Do you often have prospective collectors out there that you know of that are looking for this sort of thing? Are, are you an intermediary in some ways in this market? Uh, yes, I do. And, and you know, I, I do that in particular with Montana history. Okay. There's there's one guy here in Montana who is from Chicago and he's, he's a younger guy. You know, he's a, I guess he's a Gen Nexer. <laughs> and uh, so he, he came to Montana and fell into a slobbering love affair with Montana history. Nice. And so what's neat is I like to see him get things and he's willing to pay 
the market value. However, when I represent Montana clients across the entire state, if somebody has something rare, what I do is is I take it to the to the auction venue. Okay. I have set, you know, world records for clients with paintings or, you know, whatever treasure they had. And so what's nice is then it's fair for everybody. It's it's like a museum can bid on it, uh, a high-end collector can bid on it. My client gets the most money yep. that, that they can because you get bidding wars that can kind of sometimes be fun. But, but I'm watching out, I'm brokering for m- my people. And so if you're my client, most of my clients become friends over the yeah. years. Yeah, you know, I will. Uh, it's a pretty intimate level of work, I would assume. You take care of them, and also you're tr- entrusted. I have, you know, I have lots of of things I can't talk about. Sure. You're entrusted with their entire lives and their families' lives and their futures, and so yeah, that's why it's nice to be a Montana guy and just kind of help out Montanans at that level. Uh-huh. I do it all over the country and all over the world, but but I, I have a soft spot for- Special place in your heart for Montana projects. And people. Yeah. 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 And, and so maybe talk about that kind of phase of your work. I mean, you have become this public facing authority for this type of work. I mean, you mentioned Antiques Roadshow, you've done other public high profile engagements. I mean, there is this sort of anonymity to what you do. Like you said, you, you go, you take your pictures, then you get to spend hours in your office thinking mm-hmm. about them and analyzing them. But you're also, in in terms of this space, like a very prominent personality in this space. Talk about that. Well, for instance, an independent source just named me in the in an, in a top five list right. of appraisers, mm-hmm. and and. On that list, you know, are a couple of my heroes, the Kino brothers, who are really sweet friends of mine, Lee and Lee and Leslie Kino of of the yeah, you know, they're in the East. Yeah, do they um, do they count as two of the top five <laughs> or one of the top five? I yeah, they, the, you know what they have in their head, they count for twenty of the top five. Okay, yeah, yeah. So no, they're they're cool guys. But um, so to be, let's get serious here. To be an expert and. And have people come to you. That's that's really something that that it's my God, that feels good, and, yeah. and I live up to it, you know. And and when I used to, uh, you know, have a crowd come into an appraisal event, being a Montanan, I always stood high and smiled for twelve hours. It, it it wears you out, you know, these events. But but I wanted everybody who came in there to see a Montanan with a friendly face, you know. Yeah. And so I apply that to being a, 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 you know, a national expert and sometimes an international expert. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I'm getting, I'm blushing here. I, I'm just some dude from Missoula, Montana. You know, but sure. but uh, but seriously, I, I try to try to be sterling of of all aspects. Well, I mean, that then that's admirable, Tim, in the sense that you you got to be really good at the fundamentals to mm-hmm. achieve the level of success you've achieved. And like at, at your level, you, you you have to be able to whoever hires you to deliver. And it sounds like that's mm-hmm. your, your approach. And, there's, and you can tell that in, in your web materials as well. Like no client too big, no client too small. We're mm-hmm. gonna serve everybody with the same level of excellence. I, I love my, my web inquiries. Um, I, I had a guy call me from, he was, he was down south recently and is in the morning. I have my coffee and I'm sitting there and I pick up the phone and I go, hi, what, you know, he goes, I have something, sir. I go, what have you got? And he goes, the Holy Grail, and I go, I go. Pardon me, and he goes, you know Jesus's cup. Oh, Jesus, it was the real Holy Grail. He had it. I go, I go. Well, where'd you find it? And he goes, I just stumbled upon it. And I go, I go. I'm sorry, I don't have any expertise in that one. Wow. <laughs> but um, on the other hand, you know, I I did recently have a client call, and her father is in his 90s, mm-hmm. and. He was in California, and so during the war, uh, his grandmother had been an art collector, and uh, she and the family were taken off to the camps and murdered by the Nazis. And so uh, he was luckily at a boarding school in the Netherlands, and the painting came to him after the war, but, yep. but recently they decided that he was had to move out of his home. And the artist was an Austrian artist, a, a secessionist from around the turn of the century. Okay. And this painting, through research, it was found it hung next to The Kiss by Gustav Klimt. Wow. And anyway, what was neat was uh, through the process of doing my work and working with some folks in the industry who helped to market it, that thing went 10 times world record and, and, and brought 
brought that whole story to fruition. You know, it, 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 you know, his grandmother collected this work and then he held on to it and then his family benefits with it, but it also brought it into the public eye. Mm -hmm. And that one, I, I probably won't, you know, mention the name of the artist or which it was, but, but it just felt so rewarding to, to kind of help deliver, to shoot that free throw at the end of, of the 20th century of, of horror that that family went through. Yeah. But the painting made it and, and he made it. Yeah. yeah. Talk about, Tim, if you would. So I don't necessarily want to frame this as the other side of this conversation, but I would assume that at times you've had uh, individuals and families approach you and they have emotional attachment to family memorabilia, inheritance, et cetera, that you have to navigate. But also sometimes I would assume people come to you thinking something is special and very valuable and you have to say, you know, this actually isn't all that valuable or maybe it's a fake or what, whatever. Talk about maybe some, how you approach those conversations. Yeah, I used to do it with compassion. Sure. You know, you know that their hopes are up. I was doing a an appraisal event over in Coeur d'Alene, and there's there's some a couple sat and waited. It, it was quite a long line, and I was watching them out there, and they had a work of art that I couldn't see it when when they were holding it, but they came up and and they they go, we have been told this is very very valuable, and I looked at it and I and I said it is valuable because it was given to you by your dear friend, and you've had it all these years, and. And you know they kept pressing me for a monetary value, and and finally I I did give them one, and they cried <laughs> and because it was it was way lower than they thought, and it's like that's hard to deal with. But I I tried every avenue I could to just say it it truly is valuable, which it was. It it was a gift from their departed friend sure. who wanted them to have it. Yeah, I mean that opener shows that compassion. It is valuable because it was given to you by somebody special. Yeah, but sometimes the you know you can't sell it for a lot of money. Sure. But but hey, you know I'm a big advocate that anything old is cool. It doesn't have to have a big price tag on yeah. it. So in our remaining time, Tim, talk about you know kind of what's next for you. I mean, you're continuing this appraisal work, but other ways to engage the public and tell your story. Well, what are you cooking up? So we are continuing. Uh, just waiting for the. I'm a I'm a junkie. I'm waiting for the next call all, all the time. We have a couple of good collections coming up. It's funny. I you know I did the Al Capone collection this year, and all of a sudden then I get contacted about the John Dillinger collection. Yeah, so, yeah. so instead of being Mr. Fancy Spancy art appraiser, I'm I'm a gangster guy now. Yeah, so. you're avoiding the specialty, right? <laughs> yeah, right. My new specialty. You know, we we have one major art museum, which I am so honored. I I won't say what that is yet uh-huh. until the contract happens, but. It's actually will benefit Montana, and and so that's coming up, and then continuously, you know, day by day, I'm representing you know estates and clients and people with fine things across the state, and you can always uh, just Google my name and put appraiser at the end, Timothy Gordon appraiser, oh, yeah. and Lots you'll find of stuff me. Pops up. Yeah, yeah. And, and how do you then make choices? You got a lot of inbound mm-hmm. coming in. I'm sure you have your own sort of priorities and ambitions. How do you balance that? How do you make choices about where you allocate your time and effort? Yeah, that's always tough, especially when you want to help the Montana people who yeah. sometimes are a time soak. It's usually just off to the races. Um, it's like if an exciting project comes up, we just buy the airplane tickets and go. And go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But with everything, you know, there's meat and potatoes time too. And so I actually do, you know, finer estates around Montana too, meaning, you know, if somebody passes away and, and the family is in need of somebody to represent them, we even hit, hit it at that level. Okay. Curious to get your thoughts on this sort of emergent form of art in the digital space. Uh-huh. And some of these, I mean, it's the, the market's craze around NFTs and cryptocurrencies and yeah. these digital assets has come off a little bit, but at the same time, some of the valuations on some of this digital art is is eye-catching for sure. Yeah, Talk about your attitude toward that. What's interesting is, is there, who is doing the first created collectible? I mean, it, it sounds weird, but Warhol was, yeah, you ways. know, and then you look at pop culture things that weren't meant to be collectibles that are almost like an NFT, mm-hmm. like a Pokemon card that will sell for a hundred thousand yeah. dollars, you know? So what that, I remember my daughter who's in her late twenties, we sprung for a really rare, I think it was a Jigglypuff card when she was a kid and we paid like a hundred bucks for sure. it. Well, a little bit like an NFT. So, so moving forward into this, you know, they're, they're tr- you know, I don't quite understand how it's all melding with cryptocurrency and, and investment, but I do think that 
some of these things might down the road just be, you know, people have paid so much money for them that people will get hooked on the whole concept sure. of how they exist. Yeah. And and then, I don't know, there's, it's, we're in an interesting world. Like when you see a Banksy painting sell in London for millions of dollars, then it, dollars and then it shreds automatically on it yeah. <laughs> after the sale. You it's know what I mean? bizarre, yeah. Yeah, it's, people are playing games with collectibles, and I like that. It's, mm-hmm. it's a creativity that adds value. And and it becomes legend and story and co- and collector juju. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and I'm fascinated by the way some of these NFTs, non fungible tokens for the listener, can be kind of integrated with an experience, right? Like so, you can buy a digital asset that the contract, the smart contract carries with it access to certain experiences that others might not have. So that's sort of this opportunity for creators to sort of expand their canvas in a bunch of new dimensions. Yeah, true. It's kind of like chess in Star Trek where it's three dimensional. Yeah, know? yeah. Yeah, it's it, people are it's it's an idea behind an idea and 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 once again going back to how does that equate to my world, you know, the the world of dead people's things, you know, collectors who like fascinating things it's kind of fascinating that people are playing with all this and and yet it does provide that experience that you're talking about and and it's got a price tag to it that is supposed to be investable i i'm not going to talk to that but, sure yeah. well at the same time like you mentioned dead people's things i'm sure there'll come a time where you're going to have a dead person mm-hmm. and there's going to be some digital asset that you have to track down it won't be the sort of actual cracking of the safe that you referenced earlier but yeah. it will be tracking down some some chain of code and, and cracking mm-hmm. that code yeah and we'll do it at that time yeah. i'm sure you will <laughs> uh, tim this has been a pleasure if people want to learn more about you and your work where would you direct them online yeah my website is g appraisals with an s g appraisals.com And I'm just a Missoula guy. You can find me. Absolutely. Tim, thanks so much. All right. Thanks a lot. Had a lot of fun. Thanks for listening to A New Angle. We really appreciate it. And we're coming to you from Studio 49, a generous gift from UM alums Michelle and Lauren Hanson. A New Angle is presented by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and the University of Montana College of Business with additional support from Consolidated Electrical Distributors, Drum Coffee, and Montana Public Radio. Keely Larson is our producer. VTO, Jeff Amet, and John Wicks made our music. Editing by Nick Mott. Social media by AJ Williams. And Jeff Meese is our master of all things sound. Thanks a lot, and see you next time.